Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Bayonetta Hard Pure Platinum run. We're in Chapter 6, this is The Gates of Paradise. So the very first verse here has you facing off against the Affinities. Oh no, sorry, these are Applauds. Applauds and Ardors. But they're on fire. And when things are on fire, it means you can either only hurt them in Witch Time, or you can only hurt them when you're wearing the... Uh, both the sets of Durga set to fire. And it's an interesting idea, but the amount of times you can take really cheap damage, which feels a little bit unfair, makes these fights, w which when they involve this kind of enemy, a lot more frustrating than I feel like they needed to be. Luckily, you don't see them that often, and I appreciate what they were trying to do. I don't think it's completely redundant of, of an interesting mechanic. I just have several outtakes of this fight where I accidentally kicked while I was going to do a Wicked Weave combo and, it, and I took damage for doing it because I, I, I hit somebody and it, it gets really frustrating. So on the right you'll notice I'm using the, the thing that keeps me in magic with two spheres of magic and the Moon of Mala Kala la 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 la. That is pretty much what I wear for the entire playthrough. Every so often I'll try a couple of different pieces of equipment for strategy reasons, but for the most, I don't really mix it up too much. I'm going to leave those moments in so you know when I'm swapping things, just for the people who you know want to follow exactly what I'm doing. Verse 2 is an, a double inspired fight. If you don't want to waste time shooting the inspireds to drop them from the sky, if you lock onto them and do a, a Tetsuzanko or the heel stomp, it will do it at a distance and it will knock them down. However, you do need magic to do it, like I did to him just then. So be aware, you will need three orbs of magic to do those moves. I wish they didn't take magic, but then I realised how exploitable they would be. So that bite, goodness me, it comes out fast. That's the thing though, when you're playing in the moment, you know, especially when you've been playing all day, you can get really sharp, and for some reason you have to finish this guy with the climax. So there you go, but it's not really a challenging verse, and, and this level came much quicker than the one before because I did not have to replay it, which is really nice to know. But it does have a very tricky Alfheim, and the Alfheims generally work like this. You either get it first time, or it takes a thousand tries. There doesn't seem to be any happy medium with it, and if they weren't part of the ranking system, this game would be considerably easier and more fun to do. It's just a fact. The Alfheims are by far more challenging than anything the game presents. The verses are really fun. The, the Alfheims are definitely where the challenge lies, and it's just, it's kind of sad that that's the way it is. So this is verse three. The problem with verse three is if you take damage on the spikes, it will count against your ranking. And you have to cross them every time you mess up to press this switch, and then a massive torrent of applauds and affinities turns up. But the cool thing here is, is because this is so boxed in, you can use the Gaze of Despair to, to get everybody angry. And if you don't know, the Gaze of Despair, not only does it make enemies attack faster, not only does it make them, I think, a little bit more damaging. You'll have to uh, double check that one. But it makes them harder to stun. And you might think, well, why the hell would you want that? Well, it makes it so that you can get more combo off them. And the best way to use Gaze of Despair that I came across was when you get a group of angels like this all around you, put on Gaze of Despair, let them all get super angry, and then use the whip. Because the big problem with the whip is it has a knockback effect, but when everybody's gazed, it doesn't knock them back. So you get a continuous stream of points, and you will go from 0 to 9.9 .9 in a second. Because they're not flying away, you're hitting 3 or 4 angels on every rotation. It is literally just an awesome feeling watching your score just shoot up and rock it. It's really, really nice. I don't use the Gaze of Despair that often though, guys. It's not because I'm under some illusion that it makes the game easier or in fact harder, because it makes it easier to get combo points, but I just don't like the visual effect, so that's my main reason for avoiding it. Later on in this run, you will see me use it, because there were certain places where I was struggling for combo, and I threw it on to give me like the illusion of comfort and, and, and an advantage. So what do we have here? Torture attacks. Yeah, this this is an al an Alfheim featuring flame people. Whenever you you fight flame guys, it's just not very fun. 
because one mistake, you'll take damage, and taking damage ruins a pure platinum run. But the cool thing about this is you can use the angel arms to build your combo, but you're going to have to be aware. The enemy placement here is very deliberate, so if you kill things too quickly without doing the torture attacks, you're going to not have enough enemies to do the objective, and you will fail. Another thing to bear in mind, which is something I absolutely dislike to the nth degree, is torture attacks only count if they kill people. And I don't understand it. The objective is very clear, use torture attacks. However, if they do not kill the angel you do them to, they do not count. And to me, that's just planet bullshit, and I really don't like it. However, that's the stipulations, those are the rules, and that's exactly what we have to put up with. So this is a pair of Fearlesses with an Ardor, and as you can imagine, the Fearless and Fairness enemy type is an enemy that is intimidating, but is actually very fair. A lot of the times they're a little bit like Shadows from Devil May Cry, where they will just stalk you, and when they're stalking you, sometimes they will be very passive, and they give you a lot of opportunities to, to hurt them and to do what you want to do. However, they have the ability to paralyze you on the floor, which leads to almost immediate failure in most cases, unless you're very lucky. They also have a very quick fireball that they fire, and they have a jump attack, which will catch you out because the timing on it is very strange. But those aside, it's an enemy that I actually really like fighting. Because, compared to Joys, let's compare them to Joys. They both attack very fast, they both have range, they're both intimidating, but where the Joy is borderline on bullshitty, this guy I think is, 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 is grounded in being fair. And speaking of Joy's, how the hell did they get away with putting this at the end of the- how many enemies have we killed? This is why this took me so long, because I would do those first two waves and then as they spawned I'd get punched by a Joy. Or I'd, I'd get a Joy off screen, and she'd do a stiletto onto screen, and I'd get hit, you know? It's just completely and utterly nail-biting. I can't describe how, what you feel at this moment when you know the most lethal enemy in the Alfheim is at the end of it, and you just fought for five minutes, and one mistake is, is an instant restart. It's, it's just terrifying. And like, I think that Alfheim would be really fun if the Joys were at the beginning. I mean, look at the combo. That was actually a really good performance for me. But you can't enjoy it because you know that you're literally seconds away from immediate failure. And, and that's the thing that gets me the most with this run. Like, one of my favourite scoring systems is Devil May Cry, the original. Because you didn't have to play the game one specific way. You know? Metal Gear Rising, the score system on that makes it seem like you can do whatever you want and get a great score, but that's just not the case. Like, if you do not get no damage, you have to have a ridiculous combo, you have to have tons of Zandatsus, and you have to be really fast. Because the points you lose by not doing those things, you make up on the no damage. And doing those other things almost guarantees you get the no damage. So. Fundamentally, the scoring on that game becomes do it quick and don't get touched, and you're almost guaranteed the grade. Doing it quick doesn't bother me. The not getting touched part does, because I've always been a firm believer that it should be, you should be able to get the best rank by playing well, and I don't think playing perfectly should be the 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 only definition of playing well, because you can play incredibly fancifully, really awesomely and still get hit. But a lot of these games, you know, the, the top rank is, is reserved for just perfection. And, and I do understand that. Oh, by the way here, if you put the Gaze of Despair on, these enemies will never attack whoever else is in the room. It is so powerful and so fun to do, because then it's just a normal fight then. Like, the difference between Devil May Cry 4 and Devil May Cry 3 in the, in the score system is that they took out the no damage stipulation. And they also added, you know, how many orbs you found and all that kind of nonsense. Like, if Devil May Cry 3 didn't have a damage criteria, 
in the way of getting the SS ranks, I would have SS ranked every difficulty on that game. As it stands, I will never SS rank every difficulty on that game. Devil May Cry 4, a considerably easier game than the third title, especially with Nero because Nero is essentially Kratos in that game because it becomes super powerful with a grab that's so spammable it's, it's not even funny. And the difference is, I have, you know, SSSS rank or whatever you want to call it, S ranked, every difficulty in that game. Because no damage is, is not one of the stipulations. And I don't understand where it came from. I don't understand its philosophy. And, and I think, if I had to guess, it's the old school arcade level of difficulty living strong in these titles. Where on the old school smups, you know, on the old school platformers and action games, when you died, you only had three lives and one touch killed you. So there was this, you know hierarchy of people who could get no one credit clears, could get, you know, no miss clears where they never died, could get all these fancy clears of these of these really challenging games, and that became what people aspired to be, and those were the, the high-end, super competitive gameplay, and it's translated onto consoles in these, these action games as, you know, super perfectionist kind of runs, where you physically can't do those kind of runs unless you super invest time into just getting insanely good. And I don't think there's a problem with that, and I would never shun that. I just think there's a difference between, you know, mastering a game and playing it at a very high level. You know, because the skill ceiling difference there is, is astronomical. It's the difference between never playing it and being a master. It's, it's like double everything you've just done. Uh, something worth noting as well here, folks. Damage to Cereza does not count against your rank. I heard Hideki Kamiya say in his commentary this, and I believe him, and it's true. Which is awesome, because if it did, it would be a pain in the dick. Because she's a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. But there's a lot of games that ranking systems could be super interesting, and have proven to be maybe too specific for them to be a lot of fun for everybody, like, for instance, Ninja Gaiden. Ninja Gaiden's karma scores are essentially do ultimate techniques or don't score well. And there's a part of the community that loves ultimate techniques and loves karma running. There's a part of the community that hates ultimate techniques and doesn't play for karma. You know, there's no middle ground. And the most recent games, which admittedly don't have the best reputations, tried to mix it up a little bit by giving you points for doing certain moves and combos and things. But however, the you know, if the fundamental is bad, the score system doesn't stand a chance, and the fundamentals of those games, while not completely abysmal, compared to the first two games, are just night and day different, and different in all the bad reasons. You know, just... It's very difficult to appreciate Ninja Gaiden 3 if you played Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2. If you didn't play those games, 3 probably feels very competent. And it... It's just one of those things that the, the people who played it a lot mourn. But there goes verse 7. Now we're going to have to fight this big fella. And I've never really understood this because this is a beloved. He's a standard beloved. He's no different to any of the other ones we've fought. But for some reason, he attacks completely differently. And getting witch time off his punches is really tight. So you want to try and bait the axe. However, when you're at a distance, he'll do this, which is a aerial meteorite attack. However, it injures him, which is really useful. So you can use it to do massive damage to him. A little bit of trivia that I learnt from watching the developer commentary. The person who programmed this guy is the same person who programmed the El Gigante in Resident Evil 4. And the design of this dude is literally, we want an enemy like the El Gigante from Resident Evil 4. Which, if that's not awesome, I don't know what is. But this is a pretty simple fight, as long as you remember he doesn't fight like any of the other beloveds you've come across. He's, he's special, but I'm not entirely sure why. You might be wondering why I'm avoiding his core to do big damage. I'm doing it purely for combo reasons. On hard, the combo requirement is, is often the thing you fail the most. Because sometimes the combos don't flow, the points don't stack up, you don't get the multipliers. You think you're doing something really stylish and your multipliers at dog shit zero. And you fail. It's just It just happens sometimes. I am a fan of this cutscene though. Poor dude was, was smitten with a little girl, which 
you know. We're not going to overanalyze that <laughs> Lolita complex. Well, you've got to love it when your computer decides to pop up a random window, because whenever you're recording in Adobe Premiere, it stops the recording. Like, why does that shit even happen? Stupid machines. But this is verse 9. This is a joy, and she's incredibly spammy. Uh, this part right here was probably, aside from the Alfheim that I struggled on, one of the most frustrating sections because I wanted to do it quickly and the quicker I went the more I got hit and if you get hit here because the verse is in the corner it registers towards your rank. But here's the first form, it is a mirror match against Bayonetta. She's incredibly simple though because compared to Jean, you know, this thing just does not compare. She's nowhere near as aggressive, she's nowhere near as evasive. However, she does have moves that you've seen Jean use and Joy's use, so be aware of them. Like, that's the stiletto right there. But just wicked weaves, kick her ass, and bear in mind, I don't think there's a checkpoint on the next sequence. So, you see that? The instance the fight happens, she does the whip attack, which is so fast, and she's split as well, which I don't think I knew Joy's could split, because I always killed them so quickly that they didn't have chances to do it. However, she did just then. But the cool thing is, when they split, they give you an opportunity to get more style points. Just be aware, whenever shit's exploding and you can't see, chances are there's a Joy somewhere doing an attack, so you want to always preemptively evade, just in case. She parried me just then, I knew what she was doing. Funny story about what you just saw. I, I got the Witch Time as she was launched, I went up to try and combo her, but she was too high, so I couldn't do it. The amount of times I've gone up after a launch to try and juggle somebody, especially a Joy, it's come out of Witch Time and she's after Burner kicked me. Not even funny. <laughs> it happens so much. Like, especially Jean, because sometimes Witch Time lasts really long, other times it doesn't, and I believe the game says it's, it's indicative of how much damage you would have taken from the, the attack you dodged. So the more powerful the attack when you dodge it, the more Witch Time you get. But sometimes it, it feels like when you're in the middle of a combo, the witch time extends itself for the sake of your combo. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that, programmy stuff, that I'm, I'm super uh, non too plus on how it works. But that's the end of Chapter 6. There's the pure platinum rank, and I hope you're enjoying this, because it was hell to make, but it was definitely a pleasant side of hell. I thought it was going to be so much worse than it was. And I just really want it to do well on the channel because it deserves to. It's, it's one of those rare projects that I don't really do all that often. But thank you very much for watching. And as always, you take care now.